Welcome back. This is day two of ecology. And today we're going to be talking about how is energy transferred in an ecosystem. But before we get to that, you guys have got two do now questions. So go ahead and pause this video. And I want you to list as many abiotic and biotic factors as you can in your bedroom right now. Go. All right. So hopefully we remember from yesterday that whenever we see this word bio, it means life. So biotic factors are living things. But whenever we see the prefix a in front of one of our words, that means without. So abiotic means without life, which just simply means anything that's non-living, non-living things. So what are some non-living things in your room right now? Well, you could have said your bed, maybe you have a desk, you could have said your cell phone, um, maybe you've got a lamp or a rug, or maybe you've got some pencils or some pens in your room. What else could you have in there? Maybe a computer or an iPad. What else? Hmm, I think that's a good place to stop. So there are plenty of other options you could have said. Obviously I didn't get all of them here, but if you thought of anything else and you want me to double check, just send me a message on Remind, okay? And we can check and see if it's non-living. But for biotic factors, you probably didn't have quite as many, right? You might have said you, yourself. You could have said your siblings, uh, maybe your pets. Uh, maybe you've got some plants in your room. Maybe your parents walked in. Maybe your grandparents walked in. And maybe if you haven't cleaned your room in a while, there's some bacteria lingering around, right? So all of those are examples of living factors or biotic factors that could be in your room right now. All right, but let's go ahead and get started. Now, I will warn you guys, there's a ton of notes to write down today. It's just a lot of fill in the blank notes. So I'm going to try to move this as quickly as we can so I don't keep you here for three hours, <laughs> but no promises. Um, so what do we need to know about ecology? Ecology is the study of organisms and their relationships with their environment and the other organisms in it. But this is a pretty broad term. And so because of that, we can actually study this and break it down into different levels. The biggest level that you see here in this graphic organizer is biosphere. We can then break that down into ecosystems, communities, populations, and then individual species, or even just organisms. So let's look at what each of those levels look like. So an organism is going to be any single living individual. Like we've got this cute little meerkat here. This is an individual organism. But this organism is actually part of a bigger population of meerkats. So a population is all of the organisms in a given species in one area. So I do want to be clear that populations are specific to the species. So right here we've got a, a population of meerkats, but we might also have a population of giraffes or a population of frogs. So it's specific to the species. Also, just look at these cute little meerkats hugging each other. So cute. Um, but then we can take that one step further and then look at the, this meerkat community. So this is all of the biotic factors in the given area. So in addition to our meerkat population, we've also got a biotic eagle flowing overhead and a biotic snake and the biotic grass that are surrounding them and the biotic trees. So we're looking at all of the biotic factors in the community. But then we can take it one step further and look at the ecosystem, which is all of the biotic and the abiotic factors in this given area. So in addition to all the biotic factors we just looked at, we've also got some abiotic soil and some abiotic air. Um, so we're looking at all of the living and the non-living things when we talk about the ecosystem. But then finally, we've got what we call the biosphere, which is kind of just the big overall picture. So this is what we refer to as all of the interacting ecosystems. So on this earth, we've got forest ecosystems, we've got aquatic ecosystems, we've got desert ecosystems. And the biosphere is talking about how all of those different ecosystems um, are related and interact with each other. All right. So now, food chains. We actually looked at a food chain yesterday uh, with our first do not question. And we determined that food chains show the relationships between each organism and what it eats and what eats it. So on this example, we see that this grass is being eaten by a deer which is then being eaten by a lion. And remember we said that this arrow represents the flow or the transfer of energy between organisms. So because of that, a food chain, in a food chain, there are also different trophic levels. This word trophic is referring to feeding or food. So we notice that we've got a deer 
and a lion. These are going to be in different trophic levels. And I'll elaborate on what that means in just a second. So let's look at this food chain. The first thing that we see is the sun is passing its energy to the grass because the grass is able to undergo photosynthesis. And because it's able to undergo photosynthesis and make its own food, we consider it, consider it an autotroph. But more importantly, we're going to call it a producer. This is going to be our first trophic level. It's our first feeding level. We've got our primary producers that are able to create that energy. But when that deer eats the grass, we're now going to classify it as a consumer because it is eating another organism. It's eating the grass. But because it's actually the first consumer in this food chain, we're going to call it the primary consumer, which just means the first. Okay, but then that deer, I'm sad to say, was just eaten by this lion. So this lion is also considered a consumer. But because he's not the first person to eat in this, <laughs> the first animal to eat in this food chain, we're going to call him the secondary consumer because he's eating second. <clears throat> right? So each of these, producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, these are all different trophic levels, different feeding levels. But Let's write down some notes about that. So the first organism that must always be present in a food chain is the primary producer. This is what's producing that energy through photosynthesis. So producers are organisms that can make their own food using the energy of the sun. And these are also called autotrophs. Remember that because they're able to use this energy of the sun, they undergo that process of photosynthesis. Now, consumers are organisms that eat other organisms to get the energy for growth and development that they need. And we call these heterotrophs. They have to eat other organisms. But now using what we know, I'm gonna give you guys a challenge. I want you to label this upcoming food chain with the correct trophic levels. So I just gave you three examples of trophic levels. We've got producers, primary and secondary consumers. But in this food chain, we've got more than two consumers. Hmm, so what do you think is gonna happen? I don't know. Pause this video, write down what you think and then press play when you're ready to go over it. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing you should have written down, I just completely blanked out. Let me get some water. <laughs> the first thing you should have written down for this food chain is that this grass is the primary producer, right? This grass is an autotroph that can undergo photosynthesis and produces the energy to get this whole food chain started. Um, or I should say produces the food to get this whole food chain started. Right, but then this grasshopper comes along and eats that grass. So because of that, he's going to be called our primary consumer. Now we can also abbreviate primary as just a one prime consumer, just to signal that he is the first consumer in this food chain. But then this toad's gonna come along and eat that grasshopper. So he's eating second, which means he is the secondary or two prime consumer. But now here's when things start to get crazy. This snake is then gonna come along and eat this toad. So what do you think we're going to consider him as? Well, he's eating third, which means we're gonna call him a tertiary consumer. You can also just abbreviate that three prime. All right, and now, whoo, things are about to get really crazy. This eagle or this hawk rather is eating fourth. So what do we call him? Hmm, this is a really wild word. Are you ready? It's called a quaternary. Can't even spell it. Quaternary or just four prime consumer. So he's eating four in this food chain. But I've also got one more term we can use for this hawk. Because he's listed last on this food chain and doesn't have any other predators, we can consider him the apex predator which just means he is the top of this food chain. No other predators. All right, so our hawk here is our apex predator. He's the top of the food chain. Let's keep going. So food chains also show us the relationships between predators and prey. So what are predators? Well, predators are the organisms that are hunting another organism to kill and eat it. So our links here is our predator. He is targeting another animal. And then prey are the organism that is being hunted. So this rabbit right here, if he doesn't run faster than this lynx, he's gonna be tonight's dinner. That's our 
we just looked at a food, or I'm sorry, yeah, a food chain. But now we're gonna be looking at food webs, which are a little bit more complex, but for a good reason. So food webs are actually a more accurate representation of the interactions between organisms because it shows all of the different options organisms have to eat. Out in the wild, things aren't quite as simple as just this straight line. There's a lot of different options for food that these animals can eat. They've got a full buffet out there waiting for them. They're not always just going to stick to grasshoppers or frogs, they've got other options. And so that's when we use a food web to show all of those different food options. So organisms might, Organisms might actually fit into several different trophic levels depending on this food web. And this food web will also show if that organism, an, organism is an herbivore, an omnivore, or a carnivore. So what do these words mean? Well, herbivores, whenever you see this word herb, we're talking about plants. So herbivores only eat plants. Omnivore, this word omni actually means all. So omnivores eat everything. They, they eat both plants and animals. They eat it all. And carnivores, this word carne in front looks a lot like carne, which in Spanish means meat, right? Like carne asada. So carnivores only eat meat. Now I really want some carne asada. Um, but carnivores eat other animals. Okay. So this is an is an. I'm literally falling apart here, guys. This is an example of what a food web looks like. It looks kind of like a spider web. That's what it was really named for because it shows all of the different um, crossing lines that show these different relationships between organisms and what they can eat. So let's look at this frog down here, for example. We see a lot of arrows pointing towards the frog and a lot of arrows pointing away. So that shows us that this frog can actually choose to eat this caterpillar. It can choose to eat this worm. It can choose to eat this beetle. So all the arrows that point towards an organism show what it can eat. But then we also see some arrows pointing away from an organism. And this shows what can eat it. So here we see that this frog can also be eaten by a snake. This frog can be eaten by this bird. This frog can be eaten by this raccoon. So food webs are better because they show all of these different relationships. Okay, we see all of the, the different options that these animals eat and can be eaten by. Now, on that food web, you may have noticed that we saw plants, we saw animals. The only thing we did not see on this food web is something called a decomposer. But what exactly is a decomposer? Well, they decompose something, but what is it? Well, decomposers are actually going to eat dead material or dead matter and return the nutrients in it back to the environment to be used by other living things. So these are kind of like the recyclers of the environment. Okay, because they take that dead matter, they eat it, and then they recycle those nutrients back into the environment so that we can use them again. Decomposers are the only reason we don't just have random carcasses lining our streets because decomposers come in, they eat the dead stuff, and they recycle and return those nutrients back to the environment as they break it down. So we do not include decomposers in food webs because they're not picky, they eat everything, but only after it is dead. That is their one requirement. They're like, I'm not gonna touch it if it's alive, it has to be dead. So decomposers include things like worms, bacteria, fungi, certain insects, and more. Um, so this is why if you ever see, like the other day when I ran over that squirrel on the way to school, or I, I saw the squirrel get run over. Well, it wasn't a squirrel, I'm going crazy, it was a rat. I saw, <laughs> I saw a rat get run over. The only reason that rat is not still there today is because these decomposers came in and started breaking down that flesh and recycling that matter so it can be used by other animals. Again, we're really broken down into the soil, right? So then plants can use it as fertilizer to grow again, okay? Um, so decomposers are super, super important. Now, the reasons organisms consume other organisms is, is to get the raw material and energy for growth and development. This just means organisms have to eat in order to get energy. This is why we have to eat, it's to get energy to do the things that we need to do. Same thing for every other animal on this planet. We've got to eat to stay alive. But each time energy is transferred through these different trophic levels, a little bit of energy is lost as heat. And we'll talk more about that in the upcoming days. Um, but this also means that to support an ecosystem, there needs to be more producers than primary consumers, more primary con consumers than secondary consumers, et cetera. And this is why we represent food chains as a pyramid. 
to demonstrate that in order to support this ecosystem, there have to be more producers than primary consumers, then secondary consumers, and then so on. So we've developed this energy pyramid to represent the amount of biomass. This is basically just means um, animal or plant material that's used as fuel. Right, so anything you eat to get energy needed at each trophic level. Okay, and we'll talk about more about that on, I think it's the next slide, but this bottom level is especially important. Just kidding, it's on the next one. So here's another example of what this looks like. Again, we see that producers are the biggest level down here, leading into primary consumers, secondary and tertiary. But remember since this tertiary, this owl is on top and doesn't have any other predators on this food chain, we're gonna consider him an apex predator. He has no other predators in this food chain. He is the top dog. Now, this is that last slide I was referring to. So the reason it's super, super important to have the most producers on the bottom is listed right here. So energy is usually supplied to the ecosystems through the sun, which is used by the plant to make their own food through photosynthesis. These plants are the only reason we're able to, to, to sustain an ecosystem because they are able to use the energy from the sun through photosynthesis and produce glucose. So producers, autotrophs are super, super important. So although energy is constantly lost at each trophic level, because of the plants, it's always being replenished. Thank you, plants. Next time you guys see a plant, I want you to thank it because it is the reason you're still alive today. Because although energy is lost every time we eat something, um, we always have those producers producing more energy or producing more glucose to give us the energy we need to stay alive. So that's why it's super, super important that we have this large level of producers on the bottom to keep everything else alive because this entire food chain relies on these producers, okay? Because as far as I'm aware, we can't use the sun to make more glucose, okay? This owl can't use the sun to make more glucose. These grasshoppers can't use the sun to make more glucose. It all falls on the responsibility of the producers. So this is also why it's super, super important that we keep these trees and plants alive on this earth because without these plants, guys, we're screwed, I'll say it. Um, so again, plants, producers, super, super, super important to make sure we're sustaining and keeping the ecosystem alive. All right, now that is officially all I've got for you today. I'm so sorry if I talked too much, but um, use this information to answer your exit ticket questions. Let me know if you have any questions and have a wonderful day. I will see you guys tomorrow.